So the story I want to tell you takes place on January 29, 2055. It's a crisp winter afternoon, and we're all gathered in Asheville, North Carolina, at the home of Miguel Jose Rodriguez. Today is Miguel's 100th birthday. That's him sitting over there, that dapper-looking gentleman wearing the crisply ironed Gurabera, sipping that locally brewed beer. I know, you can't possibly believe he's a day over 80. That's one of the great things about being alive in 2055. Now, Miguel is not alone today, obviously, as you can tell. Five generations of his family have come together to celebrate this very important day. Now, most of them didn't have to travel very far. They lived nearby. For you see, in this future where work is distributed and virtual, young adults don't have to scatter across the planet in search of the good life. So today, for the party, many of the younger members of the family actually walked a few blocks. Others rode their bicycles. Now the old folks, they took the incredibly efficient mass transit system. No one came by car. In fact, except for a few of the older uncles in the family, no one even owns a car anymore. Why put up with the hassle? There's incredibly efficient mass transit in every city in America. And if you really need a car, there's a share car service on almost every corner. Today, life is completely different. And they've all gathered together for this party. And Miguel really loves living in the future. There are a lot of things he thinks are great about it. But like everybody his age, sometimes he can't help but start talking about the good old days. And that's what he's doing right now to that group of incredibly attentive great-grandchildren who are gathered around him. Now, they've heard Pap Pap stories hundreds of times before, but he can be entertaining. And besides that, all of their mothers said to them, be nice or else. Not everything is different in the future. Right now, Pap Pap's on one of his favorite topics. You should have seen the house that Mamma and I lived in back in the day. Nearly 5,000 square feet. It was so big that you could get lost in that place. In fact, I remember the time we lost little Allie. We looked for half a day for her. Mamaw finally found her, buried under an avalanche of clothes in her bedroom. Now, little Inez, who is uh, Pap Pap's great-great-granddaughter, she's about 13 years old, she always perks up at this part of the story. Because like her Aunt Allison, she really loves clothes. But she can't imagine anyone having an avalanche of clothes. What a waste of time and space that would be. Inez designs most of her own clothes. She just takes the personal fabricator that they've got at the house, puts her pattern into it, and poof, she's got a brand new outfit. When she gets bored with it, it goes back into the recycler, and she has the materials for her next outfit. What she really loves to do, though, is post all of those designs online, where her friends can vote on them. In fact, a few of her outfits have even been copied by other girls. That's what excites Inez. She doesn't want an avalanche of clothes. But an avalanche of thumbs-ups for her designs, that would be way cool. Now, Inez has actually been to the, house, the place where Pap Pap's house used to be. It's long gone. It would cost way too much to upgrade it to meet the new environmental standards. And its place is a park in a city filled with parks. And she even knows what happened to some of Pap Pap's house. It was recycled and used to build the affordable apartment complex where her friend Bobby lives. Now, let me tell you about Bobby for a minute. He may be more than just a friend. Inez is not sure yet. But she is sure about one thing, and that is she is way jealous of the apartment complex he lives in. It's got the coolest windmills in town. It's got a great rainwater recycling system, and it generates more than 100% of its energy right there on site. Now, Inez's daydream is interrupted by Pap Pap. For an old man, he knows how to command attention. And another thing, what is it with you kids and not going to school anymore? My in, day, in my day, we got our butts out of bed every morning and went off to the school nine months out of the year. We took education seriously. Pap, Inez has to be careful here and not laugh out loud. Some of Pap Pap's ideas are just so old-fashioned. She learns every day. Right now, she's learning Mandarin from her friend Kim, who lives in Shanghai. She's learning botany, working with her mom in the community garden. She can't imagine anybody learning anything in a classroom. And another thing, Pap Pap's on a roll now, right? But here comes Inez's mother, Susan, to rescue the captive audience. Come on, kids, we need you in the kitchen because we've got to get the dinner ready. Inez hops up with the other great-grandchildren, and they all scamper off. And for just a moment, Pap-Pap looks sad because he's lost his audience. But he's not too worried. He knows they'll be back soon. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a future that I would love to live in. 
and I think we have the ability to create it. I think we can create a world of sustainable abundance where all of us can live fulfilling lives, where we can build stronger communities, and where we can enjoy greater well-being without sacrificing our planet. And as all of you know, we're making great strides in that direction. The green movement is clearly here to stay, but there is one piece of the puzzle that we have neglected. If we are going to create a positive, sustainable future, we must have a new story to go with it. Now, I am not talking about green PR or echo propaganda or any of the typical ways we might think about story. I'm talking about the story that resides deep within inside us. The story that really tells us what our values are, informs our fears and our dreams, and most importantly, tells us how to put those values into practice. The problem right now is that we're telling the wrong stories about sustainability. We're focused too much on doom and disaster and destruction. Makes great movies. But somehow, we have gotta get over the idea that we can scare humanity into going green. Our sustainable future does not have to be so bleak. We can live in a world of abundance where sustainability is a core value, where it is accessible to everyone, not just those people who can only afford to pay the privilege of a green premium. That's what a world of sustainable abundance is all about. We also have to rethink what we mean by the word, of abundance, word abundance. For more than a century, we have decided, been persuaded that consumption means is the only way to, to lead to prosperity. We have created a world that is littered with things in order to create the good life for people. We all know that that mindset has caused serious damage to our, to our world. What we're also finding out is it hasn't done much for us either. There's a whole bunch of studies out there today that suggest that the more stuff you have actually doesn't make you happier. In fact, at some point, the relationship is negative. It turns out that if everyone in the world had as much stuff as most of us have, we would have six billion very unhappy people on one extremely unhealthy planet. Now, this idea of sustainable abundance does not reject materialism. It values objects for their true cost and their real value. But let's be real. We're going to have to give up the McMansions. We're going to have to give up the Hummers. But in their place, we are going to design objects that are beautiful and have utility, that can be repurposed at the end of their life, and that make the most of all of our limited resources. Now, there are people who say we can't afford this world of sustainable abundance because they're locked in a mindset of an economy that's all about scarcity. If I win, you must lose. An abundance economy monetizes those things that are unlimited, knowledge, creativity, innovation, and altruism. There is a lot of talk today about a new triple, ba triple, line, balance, bottom, triple line balance sheet for businesses. Why not the same thing for individuals, for families, and communities? Why isn't happiness valuable to us? It's up to us to decide the relative value of things versus ideas versus social participation. Once we define what it means to live the good life, we will be able to extend it to many more people around the world. We are on our way to creating this world. We have the ability. There are people out there today who are already doing the things that we need to do to create this new story. For the rest of us, it's time to join in. We have to, through our actions, through our deeds, and through our words, convince everyone that we are committed to a word, world of equity, a world of individual fulfillment, and a world where we are going to protect the planet. We can create a world of sustainable abundance. Speaking of stories, let's go back to the one we were thinking about with Pap Pap for just a minute. Looks like the kids did a great job of setting the table. Look at, look at all of that locally grown produce, or locally sourced food, homemade breads, homemade pies. When was the last time you really sat down to a meal that really, really tasted good, not something you just gobbled up? And the aunts and uncles who are in the family band are over in the corner, and they're warming up. They're going to play a happy birthday in just a minute. And there's the, the, the guest of honor sitting at the end of the table with his eyes slightly closed, his foot tapping along to the music. He's got a big smile on his face. And I know why he's smiling. He's proud of his family. He's proud of the world that they live in, because they really have created a world that is so much better than the good old days. He's just glad he's alive to share in it. I hope all of us get to share in that world one day. The ultimate decision is what choices we make. I hope you choose a world of sustainable abundance. Thank you.